Have you ever heard of the FPS game Singularity? Not many people have, but back in 2010, I purchased a copy on Steam and ended up really enjoying the game. It was a game I kind of just bought on a whim. I picked up the game a week or so after its launch, but I hadn't really seen any marketing of any kind for the game before then. I believe I encountered the game on the front page of the Steam store, and the game's concept got my attention. A time-bending sci-fi first-person shooter set in an alternative history world. I was relatively young at the time and had fallen in love with the Bioshock franchise after playing the first game years before. That game left me with an itch for something similar. Bioshock 2 had also come out in 2010, just a few months before Singularity, and I played that game at launch. Because of that, the franchise was fresh in my mind. I was on the hunt for something that would satisfy a bit of the Bioshock fever I had, and the Steam reviews for Singularity left me with the impression that I had found just the game for that. I made my way through Singularity's campaign and enjoyed it, but once I was done with it, I put the game down and never fired it back up. It has been well past a decade since my first playthrough of Singularity, and it has come up in my mind here and there over the years. I've brought up Singularity in conversation with my friends before, and none of them have heard about the game. To make matters worse, I rarely see the game discussed online, making me feel like I was one of the only people to experience this gem. It was finally time to jump back into Singularity and see if the game held up to the nostalgia I have for it. I also researched the history of Singularity to learn more about its troubled development and to see how well it sold, which was not well at all. Singularity was the last game developed by Raven Software before Activision moved them over to being a full-time support studio for Call of Duty, a fate that other studios have also suffered. I'll cover more of the game and studio's history later, but let's jump into the setup for the game. In Singularity, the player takes control of Captain Nathaniel Renko, a member of the US military. Renko has been sent to investigate a mysterious Russian island named Katorga 12 with Nathan Drake. Yeah. Keep smiling, asshole. I'll see you soon. I mean James Devlin, but he's played by Nolan North. Grass must be scared shitless if they're willing to risk an international incident sending us in like this. On your way to the island, you witness a few visual disturbances before your helicopter is downed by a blast from Katara 12. <laughs> Seemingly the sole survivor of the crash, Ranko makes his way through an abandoned town before Devlin contacts him over the radio. They got punched out. Copters down and we're scattered. Don't know how many KIAs yet. Over. Satellites got you about 30 clicks south of a radio tower. Get your team there, Captain. We're pulling you out. On Ranko's journey to Devlin, you start to understand something went very wrong on this island, and that a miracle element named E99 was discovered here. Researchers had their whole families relocated with them to Katorga 12. With the current state of affairs on the island, it does not bode well for what Renko will discover. Before that, another blast occurs, sending Renko back into the past, when the building he is occupying is burning down. Renko moves quickly to escape the building and stumbles across a man falling into the flames on the floor below. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like Ranko has seen any time traveling movies before, or he would know altering the past never ends well. Ranko saves the man and proceeds out of the building. On the way out, a voice calls out to Ranko by name, pleading for him not to save Demichev. Renko, stop. Don't let Demichev the voice is silenced by an explosion as Ranko continues his way through the building. Once out of the flames, Ranko learns that the man he saved is none other than Nikolai Demichev. Another scientist named Viktor Beresov is thankful Demichev is safe. These two are the lead researchers of E99 research on Katorga 12 and will have major roles for the rest of the game. With the timeline now completely f Katorga 12 decides it's time to send Renko back into the present day. Back in the modern timeline, it is immediately apparent serious consequences have occurred from Renko's actions. A statue of Demichev has replaced the Stalin one that stood there once before. Devlin notices the changes as well and starts having a meltdown, calling out over the radio for somebody to contact him back. Titan one actual. Copy. For f sake, someone copy back! Copy back and tell me things look a little south of normal because I'm officially freaking out! From this point up to where Renko is captured are some of my favorite parts of the game. There's an unsettling atmosphere as you make your way through an apartment building with corpses of the families from Katorga 12 scientists left inside. Notes and recordings document the terrible situation happening on the island as it collapsed into a hellscape. If anyone should find this recording, please. Our children are hiding in a room at the top of the stairs. They only have a limited amount of food and water and won't be able to last for much longer. Please. They're so scared. 
This building seems haunted by its past, as you can hear children giggle and a ball bounces down the staircase. Raven Software nailed the tense atmosphere of this segment, and soon enough Ranko grabs his first weapon, the Centurion Revolver, right before stumbling across his first enemy. I wasn't quite ready for this jump scare, but this area of the game really keeps you on your toes and positions enemies really well to scare you. Unfortunately, right as I was settling down into the horror vibe of the game, the corpse of the enemy I gunned down just does a backflip and starts clipping through the floor and just starts tweaking out. I was pretty concerned that I was in for a bug-filled ride, but luckily I really only encountered one other bug that I would consider notable, involving an NPC disappearing during a conversation. These mutants are fairly formidable enemies this early and can soak up quite a few bullets if you aren't landing headshots. Rango keeps moving towards Devlin and enters the remains of a school, which is probably the most disturbing area of the game. The bodies of children litter the school, and apparitions appear giving you a glimpse of their final moments. Additionally, it was known E99 could mutate organisms, yet these children were fed propaganda and exposed to the element. On the way out of the school, Renko gets some more serious firepower and rendezvous with Devlin. From here on out, the action picks up, and we get some enlightening commentary from Devlin. Let's contact Titan 1 to get out of this circle, jerk. After some more exploring, the two of you end up in a shootout with a militant group that ends up capturing you both. It is here we learn that Demichev is still alive and doesn't appreciate Devlin's mouthing off as much as Renko does, so he executes him on the spot. Our embassy, right now! That's better. How is it you haven't aged a day in 50 years? Demichev demands answers from Renko regarding a device called the TMD, as it is seemingly the only way Renko could still be alive. Before he gets his answers, gunfire breaks out and Renko makes an escape thanks to our new ally, Catherine. Catherine shows us a video that serves as an exposition dump for the new state of the world and Renko's importance. Catherine is associated with a secret organization known as Mir-12 that wants to reveal the truth about the island and Demichev to the world. The video is honestly pretty goofy and looks like something hackers in a bad TV show would use to blackmail someone. In short, the video reveals that the element E-99 was discovered on Katorka-12. Nikolai Demichev and Viktor Beresov were the two leaders behind researching the element. Beresov mysteriously disappeared and Demichev took full control. With this power, he built super weapons using E-99, using them to conquer the world. Mir-12 has a mysterious journal calling out Demichev, saying a device on the island called the Singularity is linked to his rise. The journal also says that Renko is the key to lead Mir-12 to answering questions around the Singularity. The group intends to help Renko however possible, and Catherine sends us on our way to Beresov's lab in search of the TMD. This device should allow Renko to travel through time and save Beresov, who would be a great ally. It won't be long before Renko acquires a TMD, but this is a setup for the game. From here on out, you'll be working closely with both Catherine and Beresov in order to stop Demichev and use the Singularity. Before I get too much deeper into the story, I want to go over the gameplay features of Singularity and its development history. Founded in 1990 and located in Madison, Wisconsin, Raven Software has released many games during its history. Several of those games belong to the largest media franchises in the world. You might be familiar with some of their work. For me, their most notable releases are between 2002 and 2010. Singularity was the last game Raven Software would develop before they became a full-fledged Call of Duty support studio, working on 14 Call of Duty games, starting with Call of Duty Black Ops. I'll go over a few of their most high-profile releases. In 2005, Raven released Quake 4, and in 2009, they released a Wolfenstein reboot, not the Machine Games Wolfenstein reboot, which would come out a few years later. If you're familiar with these IPs, you know they actually belong to id Software, and Raven does have a fair bit of history with id. John Romero, a co-founder of id Software, worked directly with Raven Software in 1994 to create Heretic. Raven Software would also leverage the id engines to develop more games in the Heretic franchise. They would use its technology well into the 2000s, developing Star Wars Jedi Knight 2, Jedi Outcast, and Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy with id Tech 3. Between 2004 and 2006, Raven put out several superhero action RPG games, X-Men Legends, X-Men Legends 2 Rise of Apocalypse, and one of my favorites, Marvel Ultimate Alliance. A few years later, Raven would also release another X-Men game, X-Men Origins Wolverine. This is one of the only mature rated superhero games I can think of. The game featured some truly over-the-top moments, such as pulling enemies out of helicopters and shoving them into the helicopter's blades. I rented this game from Blockbuster several times before, and it seems like one of the rare occasions where a movie-licensed game is better than the movie itself. 
This game also seemed to be Raven's first time using Unreal Engine 3 to develop a game, which it would use again for Singularity in 2010. Following its release, Singularity did not sell well. Looking at the data on VG charts and some websites, the game sold well under a million copies during its lifetime. This was hot off the heels of Raven Software's Wolfenstein reboot, which also failed to put up impressive sales figures. Online shooters were on the rise, and this era was one of the most competitive you could have ever launched an FPS title into. Here's a list of FPS games that came out within a six-month period of Singularity's release. Many of these games were already a part of well-established franchises, and some of them are viewed by fans as the best game in the entire franchise. Metro 2033 stands alone as another new video game IP here, but it's based on a book series, so it's not a wholly new IP. Metro received reviews a bit higher than Singularity's, but Metro has become a cult classic now and spawned other successful entries. Metro 2033 also had cutting-edge visuals at the time and was extremely demanding for PCs. Like Crisis before it, gamers could test their machines against Metro 2033, which might have helped push the sales a bit. Back when I picked up Metro, I was definitely sold on the technical fidelity of the game. Singularity landed at a decent 76-77 on Metacritic, but against the competition, it was not enough. The marketing for the game certainly wasn't strong either. I can't recall seeing any Singularity ads on TV or anywhere on the internet besides on the Steam store. Since the release of Singularity, several gaming websites have written articles recalling this forgotten gem and the troubled development history behind it. A report from Keith Fuller, a developer at Raven Software during Singularity's production, reported that Activision Brass came over and actually canned the game after seeing its state during one of the alpha builds. At least half of Singularity's maps didn't run on the PS3, several didn't fit in memory on the 360, and even on high-end PCs, we would see the frame rate slow to a crawl during many combat sequences. A deal was negotiated with Activision, the game's publisher, to ensure the game would ship. Ten months was all the time Raven Software had to get the game in shape before it launched. To make things worse, control of the game's development was handed over to a different team, who was less familiar with the game, and additional approval and certification steps were included in the established ten-month period, cutting into the game's development time. The original story needed to be changed. Complex scenes were cut out, and the working threads of plot, gameplay, and voice acting were stitched together. The idea for audiologues were lifted from Bioshock and were inexpensive and easy to produce. They could be dropped around the game's campaign to help make the world feel more alive and assist with storytelling. The team took what was working and brought it to the forefront while cutting out troublesome areas of the game. Additional set pieces, time travel mechanics, and Team D abilities were explored, but these complicated systems didn't survive the cuts that needed to be made. In the end, it's kind of a miracle at all that the game shipped after a grueling final sprint to the finish line. While Singularity didn't receive all the mechanics and story elements that were originally envisioned for the game, what is there is still a joy to play. It's a race for the TMD with Demichev and Renko as the competitors. The TMD was one of the projects Isaac Beresov spent most of his research time on and stands for the Time Manipulation Device. Renko acquires the device in Beresov's lab, then travels back in time and saves Beresov from being murdered by Demichev. The team is affixed to Renko's left hand in a satisfying animation, and it gives Renko a variety of abilities that are used both in and out of combat. The first ability Renko gets acquainted with is the ability to move objects and organisms through time. This is used often to solve puzzles where devices are broken and have to be restored to their previously working form. When moving objects through time, you can only move them between present and past, which is a bit unfortunate, but understandable. Additionally, there are many notes scrawled on walls across Katorga 12, and you can view their contents by turning back time. A few of these notes can make you question your allies' intentions or give you hints, and the mystery behind who wrote all these notes will be discussed later in the video. In combat, you can aid your enemies, causing human adversaries to turn into dust before your eyes. This ability is particularly useful against phase ticks as well, as they swell and kill other ticks around them. It is also effective against the Zek enemies, who can phase through time, becoming intangible. Aging a Zek also causes them to slow down, making them easier to fight, as they can teleport around. The TMD has a meter that deteriorates when its abilities are used in combat. The meter builds back up over time, or E99 energy cells can be used to get an instant recharge. Aging enemies uses a fair amount of E99 energy, so I mostly just resorted to aging phase ticks in combat, as it was one of the most effective ways to deal with them. An upgrade later in the game allows you to turn human enemies into mutants, which is satisfying and can be a good distraction in the middle of a firefight. 
Before getting the TMD, Renko resorts to using his knife for his melee attacks. This isn't very effective, and getting this close to a lot of enemies is not desirable, as many of the creatures in this game resort to melee attacks. With the TMD, Renko can release energy impulses, damaging nearby enemies. While it's more effective than the knife, a shotgun blast is still much more deadly than an impulse. One of the last upgrades you get for the TMD gives you the Uber Impulse. This transforms the TMD into an unstoppable death machine with unlimited energy. Any enemy within 10 feet or so of Renko is blasted violently with energy and sent hurtling back, often with their limbs detached from their bodies. The ability to manipulate gravity is another feature of the TMD. This lets Renko move objects around effortlessly and is commonly used in conjunction with the TMD's aging ability to solve puzzles. Probably the most frequently reused puzzle in the game is grabbing a crushed box with your gravity power, moving it under an opening, and then renewing it, causing it to expand and create enough space for Renko to crouch through. Unlike the gravity gun from Half-Life, you can't really throw objects with enough force to kill enemies, but you can snatch rockets and grenades out of the air and return them to the enemies that fire them at you. The TMD can also slow down time in combat with my favorite ability, Deadlock. It's the TMD ability I use the most in combat. The TMD creates a sphere of energy that expands upon launching it. This creates a temporal field slowing down all enemies that enter it. I invested heavily into this ability as it is incredibly strong and can make most combat encounters trivial. Deadlocking enemy soldiers allows for easy headshots. When the deadlock collapses, all the bullets you fired collide with the enemies, and whole groups of enemies can drop instantly. The deadlock paired with the auto cannon became my bread and butter as I would lock enemies down and then pump them full of lead. The final two abilities of the TMD are the Chrono Ping, which just lets Renko know where to go to complete the current objective, and the Chrono Light, which allows you to pull non corporeal objects back into reality. In linear games, I can enjoy features such as the Chrono Ping as it lets me know where I can explore for more loot. Sometimes I'd come across multiple pathways and I'd check the chrono ping. Wherever it was pointing, I'd go the other way, as I could often find a weapon or a TMD upgrade down that path before going back to the main route. Chrono Light was used for a few puzzles in the game, but not much beyond that. These are the core mechanics of the TMD, but not all of them are available to you immediately, and a few of the abilities can be upgraded during the game. At several points throughout the campaign, Barisov will have Renko insert his hand into a machine, which will upgrade the TMD. These upgrades give Renko access to new mechanics such as gravity manipulation, deadlock, transforming enemy soldiers, and finally supercharging the TMD. Each one of these upgrades changes the visual appearance of the TMD as well, which is a nice bonus. The player can also spend E99 tech they pick up during the campaign at a device known as the Augmenter. The Augmenter allows Renko to improve himself and the TMD. Hero upgrades directly improve Renko and are usually pretty generic. You can upgrade Renko's health, projectile defense, inventory space, and so on. TMD perks allow you to directly improve either the impulse or deadlock abilities. The TMD can also be slotted with one equipment piece, giving it unique passive abilities. This expands to two slots later in the game, and for most of the game I used the scientist ability. This ability was pretty nice because sometimes when a weapon upgrade was picked up it would give you two times as many and the same goes for E99 tech, so this let me max out my weapons and my abilities on Renko. While the TMD occupies Renko's left hand and can be used to take down enemies, guns will be the primary tool Renko uses to fight hostiles. The world and lore of Singularity seems like it would lend itself perfectly to creating a unique arsenal of weapons for the player. Unfortunately, most of the weapons are pretty standard. Only a few of them have an interesting mechanic that helps set them apart from other FPS games' guns. Singularity allows Renko to carry two weapons and switch between them whenever. I found myself usually sticking to a primary weapon, like the assault rifle or autocannon, and alternating my secondary gun to whatever fit the situation at hand best. The first weapon Renko gets his hands on is a revolver called the Centurion. Similar to revolvers in many first person shooters, good accuracy is rewarded here, and you can put down early foes with a well placed headshot or two. Failing to hit enemies with headshots can be punishing though, as you need to fill enemies with lead to down them otherwise. I only used the Centurion while it was the only weapon at my disposal. The AR-9 Valkyrie Assault Rifle is the next weapon Renko gets, and this AR was used for a good portion of my playthrough. The Valkyrie is a very standard assault rifle and features a decent reflux sight, which makes nailing headshots a bit easier. I invested a couple upgrade points into this weapon before I ditched it for something better in the later game. The Volk S4 Shotgun is another standard firearm. I found the Volk to be particularly powerful against monsters or mutant enemies, as they often have to melee attack you to do any damage, and at short range the shotgun does massive damage. 
Against the Zek enemies, this shotgun was very effective as they would warp in and out of reality, and when they're close to you, to land a melee attack, you could just blast them and take them down easily. Now at last, we have a weapon with a unique mechanic, the Asimov SNV E99 sniper rifle gives Renko the ability to slow down time while scoped in, making it a headshot machine. This weapon is perfectly suited to taking out groups of enemy humans at a distance before they even know what hit them. While I enjoy this weapon, I only really used it a few times during the campaign, primarily in large shootouts with the Spetsnaz. Pretty soon after I got my hands on the autocannon, I ditched the Valkyrie assault rifle, and this became my main weapon. While the Valkyrie was good at dealing with human enemies, I found its magazine size could cause issues with more monstrous enemies that would soak bullets. The autocannon was bigger, more powerful, and didn't discriminate against any foe unfortunate enough to be on the other side of its rotating barrels. The fully upgraded autocannon shredded through most of the enemies in the later portion of my playthrough. The spike shot is a railgun that has an infrared scope and embeds rounds into the flesh of enemies shortly before it detonates. The spike shot needs to be charged before being fired, making it a slow weapon to use against groups of enemies, but if you can land a good shot, it is very rewarding seeing one bullet take down a group of enemies. The Death X launcher is a grenade launcher that is well suited to blowing up enemy clusters. This weapon also features a fun alternative fire mode that allows you to navigate the grenade as it rolls around before detonation. I didn't use the Death X much, but there are some specific areas in the game where you can use it to solve puzzles. The standard arsenal of weapons can be upgraded at weapon lockers, which also let you switch between any of the standard guns. In order to upgrade your guns, you will need to pick up weapon tech cases, which are spread across the game. The gun upgrades here are pretty standard, allowing you to upgrade things such as damage output, reload speed, and magazine size. As you upgrade an aspect of a weapon, it becomes more expensive to further upgrade that aspect. While the upgrades are relatively vanilla, it does add a nice sense of progression to your favorite firearms. There's a decent amount of weapon tech cases spread across the campaign, but not enough to max out every weapon. By the end of the game, the max out autocannon had become my best friend, making short work of anything in its path. Now there's also a few other special weapons you can use in the game. You can pick these guns up during certain firefights, but the ammo for them is limited and they don't count towards your current weapon slots. When you switch to one of your standard guns, you will drop the special weapons. Additionally, there are no upgrades for these weapons, but they are immensely powerful. The Seeker Rifle is the most fun gun to use in the game. The Seeker allows Renko to bring time nearly to a halt and get an explosive round through the air, allowing for crazy shots. The first shootout with this weapon is a joy, and it is available at several other points during the game as well. You can freely fire this gun also, but it's not as fun. Every first person shooter game needs a rocket launcher, and for singularity it is the RLS-7. Spetsnaz can also use this rocket launcher against you, but just like Jack from Bioshock, Renko can grab these rockets out of the air with the TMD and return them to their sender. The RLS-7 also has an alternative fire mode that allows users to gather rockets instead of shooting them in a straight path. Between the regular and special weapons, there's a decent selection to play around with and upgrade here. But besides the Seeker Rifle, none of the guns feel really special. I would have also loved to see the upgrade system offer more unique upgrades instead of simple things just like doing more damage or having more bullets in your magazine. At the very least, seeing the visual evolution of the weapon as it gets better would be rewarding. I don't want to keep comparing the game to Bioshock, but this is somewhere where Bioshock really excels with visual weapon upgrades that make you more attached to the weapons you had invested in. During the campaign, you will encounter a decent variety of enemy types. The first are the mutants. People that used to live on Katorga 12 mutated after years of exposure to E99, turning them into aggressive beasts. Mutants are tall and lanky. They will have to run up to you to attack you, so they're easy to deal with, but in the early game, they are positioned in ways to scare the player. The Zek enemies are another mutated enemy that Renko encounters frequently. Zeks can phase in and out of reality and often travel in packs. The shotgun is very effective against these creatures, as it can rapidly close gaps and most frequently melee attack you. They can also throw explosive barrels, which you can catch out of the air with a TMD, or shoot. There is a boss fight against a much larger Zek who is clad in scrap battle armor and loves to throw these explosive barrels. Face Ticks might be my least favorite enemy in the game. These little bastards are like Banelings from StarCraft. The Ticks can swarm you and deal massive damage when they attach to you. Making a Tick swell with a TMD is one of the best ways to deal with them as they will take down the Ticks around them as well. Apparently they are also pretty tasty, as Beresov even has a note in the game on how to cook them. Radions are large arachnid-like creatures that can soak up tons of damage. 
Explosives are an effective way to deal with these overgrown spiders, but they can also be attacked from the rear to do extra damage. Despite this, I would often have enough ammunition for my autocannon that I would just deadlock these guys down and blast them away from the front. While crawling through the tunnels beneath Katora 12, Renko will also counter the Reaver enemies. These are another form of mutated humans and stick together in large packs. Reavers are sensitive to sound, and if you make too much noise, the horde will come after you. When it comes to human enemies, there's just a few types. While he's in the past, Renko must deal with the Katorga security group. These soldiers are meant to protect the island, but go down easily as soon as Renko gets a hold of the TMD. These soldiers don't carry modern weapons, but will still drop ammo for the assault rifle, shotgun, or pistol. During the modern era, Renko battles the Spetsnaz, who are equipped with a whole variety of E99 enhanced weapons. I wish there were a couple more variants of the Spetsnaz soldiers, as they all appear visually and mechanically very similar. There is one Spetsnaz variant, which is the elite Spetsnaz soldiers. These enemies typically use much more powerful weapons and are far more durable than their lesser counterparts. The AI is nothing to write home about, but it's serviceable enough for a romp through this linear campaign. I played through Singularity on its hard mode, which is the hardest difficulty setting, but it was still relatively easy. The hardest parts of the game were early on before I upgraded Renko and my weapons. The biggest revelation I had for combat was realizing I could just constantly exploit the deadlock ability, turning my enemies essentially into just punching bags. There is no shortage of health kits, energy for the TMD, or ammo in the game. As I mentioned earlier, there isn't enough E99 tech for you to fully upgrade all the weapons in Renko's arsenal, so you'll have to pick and choose. A New Game Plus option would have been nice here, allowing you to fully upgrade all the guns across several playthroughs, but unfortunately that option is not here. Alright, now picking up the story from where I left off earlier. Catherine had debriefed Renko on Mir 12, Beresov, Demichev, The Singularity, and Katorga 12. Beresov was killed by Demichev in the past, and would be a great ally for the two of them to have on their side. In order to save Beresov, Renko sets off to find his invention, the time manipulation device, just referred to as the TMD. Renko journeys into Beresov's vault and gets the TMD. It's at this point in the game when Renko can start uncovering notes left scrolled around Katorga 12. These notes are mysteriously well informed on the current situation, and I'll touch on more of them as we move through the campaign. Now equipped with the TMD, Renko heads back to 1955 through a time rift. These rips in the fabric of time were created when the singularity exploded and can be manipulated with the TMD. Renko arrives during the extermination of scientists on Katorga 12, orchestrated by Demichev. It's not long before Renko finds Beresov, moments away from being assassinated by Demichev himself. Now this is where I'm a bit confused. Renko guns down Demichev, and Demichev falls out of the window on a multi-story building. How is this guy not dead? He just got away with some facial scars despite the fact I headshotted him. Regardless, with Beresov now safe, you both make your way to another time rift so Renko can return to the present. On the way there, Renko gets to use the Seeker Rifle for the first time and learns that Beresov and his researchers refused to work on the Singularity, which angered Demichev and brought about this extermination. Not long after this, Renko and Beresov reach the time rift. Renko takes the rift back to the present and Beresov stays behind. Immediately upon returning to the present, Renko is greeted by a much older Beresov. Before leaving the lab behind, you can use the game's first augmenter station and check out some old footage of an E99 experiment. This is the first recorded test of a human being moving into a rift. I am going to record my observations as I move through. I expect I will exit at Rift 6, which seems connected to this one, and has appeared near the docks. I am walking in now. A slight tingling feeling, even through the suit. I am not perceiving anything visual out of the ordinary. And as you see, no noticeable... Turn it off! On the way to meet up with Beresov in person, Renko can find a note showing a branching timeline. This is one of the first notes the player will encounter, but there'll be many more along the journey. On his way to rendezvous with Beresov, Renko fights his way through hordes of mutants and zex. Luckily with the TMD and the gravity upgrade, Renko is much more formidable in combat than before, allowing him to fight large groups of enemies more comfortably. Shortly before meeting up with Catherine, there's a few more notes. One reads, Starting to forget. It's been too long. And another one states, he started it all. It sounds like whoever's been writing these notes down has been at it for a while and knows something we don't. Renko makes his way through an office building on the way to the tower. Inside, notes reveal Demichev had secretly been experimenting on humans with E99 even though it was off limits. 
This helps explain the quantity of Zex and mutants roaming around the island. The final two notes in the office start to make Renko question his allies more as they read, Mere 12 is wrong, and several lines crossed out before ending on, Don't trust Beresov. Just after leaving the office building, Renko ends up in a ring with the King Zek. This fight's quite easy as the King is just too eager to throw barrels at Renko. Just grab the barrels out of the air as they're thrown at you, and chuck them back, and then fire away at the glowing spots on the King. Once you put the King down, Catherine shows back up to lead you the rest of the way to Beresov's tower. Catherine and Renko arrive at the base of the tower and call the lift down, but have to fight a swarm of bloodthirsty Zex while waiting. This encounter was one of the more memorable ones in the game as the Zex must climb a tall electric fence to get to you. Rengo can use his TMD to keep these fences electrified, frying any Zex attempting an ascent. Inside the tower, it's hard for Beresov to believe Rengo really has an itch a day, as for him it's been 50 years since their last encounter in person. Beresov debriefs Renko on the state of the world and Demichev. Demichev wanted the TMD for his own research, and when Beresov refused to hand it over to him, he had all of Beresov's companions slaughtered. He was also obsessed with the singularity and all the power it held. Just a few months after getting the singularity online, an accident occurred causing the device to explode, killing many. E99 radiation mutated all surviving organisms on the island. At this point, E99 devices were already being mass produced for general purposes and for powerful super weapons. While going back through the game footage here, it's pretty apparent that Raven Software was on a real time crunch. Look at this newspaper cutout of Demichev. All the titles seem good, but the actual article text is just randomized text like you'd see on a website template or something. Actually, all the newspaper articles are like this. It would have been nice to have some maybe Russian text in there, as this random cluster of letters really stands out a bit. Anyway, Demichev rose through the ranks of the USSR and was able to convince Khrushchev to drop an E-99 bomb on the east coast of the United States. This bomb did massive damage and completely reshaped the geography of the east coast. At the same time, the USSR began a war campaign in Europe, and within six months, they held control of the world. Once the world was under their power, Demichev used a large number of his supporters to overthrow Khrushchev and become Chancellor for life. Okay, that's the second time in the game so far that we've got an exposition dump in a video like this. This is another pretty good indication that Raven Software was under a pretty bad time crunch. It's easier to whip up little videos like this in After Effects than it is to come up with a number of elaborate cutscenes that you have to put into the game. Even if we did have nicer cutscenes for things like this, the same plot elements would probably still be conveyed to the player. At this point in my game I had a bug and Beresov just completely disappeared even though he's supposed to have more dialogue. I tried reloading my save and closing the game, but he just wouldn't come back. Luckily Catherine's also here and kind of summarizes what he was supposed to say. If Renko can destroy the singularity in the past, then history should correct itself. Also at this point, even after going back over the footage, I'm not exactly sure what the singularity is supposed to do. I guess it's just some kind of massive device that does… something? Regardless, the plan is for Renko to get his hands on the E-99 bomb and blow up the singularity. Luckily for Renko, Beresov has found a E-99 bomb on Katorga 12, located aboard the ship called the Pearl. The first stop on our way to the Pearl is unfortunately through the sewers. This will be Renko's first time encountering the phase ticks, and I died here more than I would like to admit. A fatal flaw in my approach to this was not using the aging ability against the ticks, which is very effective against them. Just as Renko is making his way out of the sewers, a few more notes appear, warning him of a monstrous creature. It's not long before Renko encounters this beast and is thrown out of the sewers by it. Renko briefly meets back up with Beresov, who helps explain how he will get him to the docks before the two of them are attacked by Spetsnaz soldiers. This is a long shootout, as the enemy is dead set on getting Demichev the TMD. It's not long before Renko is crawling through the tunnels beneath Katorga 12 again, battling his way through reverts and Spetsnaz alike on his journey to the ship. Renko reunites with Catherine as the two make their final push to the railway, which should take them to the docks. One note left on the ground during this area of the game tells Renko not to trust Catherine. At this point you can probably make a pretty educated guess on who is writing these messages, but all will be revealed at the end of the game. Catherine is captured, and Renko fights his way through many Spetsnaz in order to save her. Moments before saving Catherine, a final note emphasizes that we should not trust her. Ignoring these messages, Renko saves Catherine, and the two board the train to the docks after Renko uses a TMD to restore it. Things can't stay quiet for long on Katorga 12, and soon enough, the monstrous creature we escaped from earlier attacks the train. This is an enjoyable boss fight with a fun few set pieces. The worst part about it is having to deal with some phase ticks that are on board the train and like to attack you in tight spaces. 
Like most Resident Evil bosses, here you're looking for the glowing bits on the monster. Shoot them enough and you'll do serious damage to the beast. After seemingly ending the monster, Renko makes his way to the front of the train, but the beast re-emerges. Renko draws upon the power of the TMD supercharger and fries the beast, before escaping on a lone train car with Catherine. Good job, Renko. The train gets the two close to the docks, but there's still some distance they need to cover on foot. Catherine stays behind as the two are having issues contacting Beresov. A couple more messages around this area warn Renko it's still not fixed and that Beresov had it all wrong. Just as Renko reaches the docks, a blast occurs sending him back to the 1950s for the first time in quite a while. Here a fun little shootout occurs as Renko is equipped with a seeker rifle and there are many environmental hazards to exploit. After wreaking havoc in the past, Renko is sent back to the future and repairs an E99 power source. With this power, he can raise the pearl out of the water and temporarily restore it to its previous condition. This is another very memorable moment from the game, as the Pearl can't maintain the state for very long, and the ship starts to rapidly come apart as Renko makes a mad dash for the E-99 bomb on board. The condition of the ship rapidly decays, and Renko is assaulted by Zex as he nears the cargo hold. The Pearl starts to take on a lot of water, but Renko arrives to the E-99 bomb just before the whole ship goes down. With the bomb in Renko's possession, he escapes the ship and makes his way back to Beresov. Unfortunately, Beresov has bad news for Renko. Catherine tried to provide a distraction for Renko to escape and was gunned down off screen. I was pretty upset when I initially heard this, as there aren't very many characters in the game to begin with. If you're going to have one of the characters you've spent the most time with die, at least do it in front of me. Hell, Devlin got a better send off than Catherine did, and he was only around for a couple hours. Motivated not to let Catherine's sacrifice go in vain, Beresov sends Renko to the cooker to charge the E-99 bomb for the final assault on the Singularity. On the way, another message is encountered, simply stating, I was a fool. Inside of the E-99 processing area, Renko starts to encounter Radions, monsters who have been heavily mutated. While powering the facility back up, the game leans back on a few more of the jump scares and horror elements from the beginning of the game, which is definitely refreshing after so much combat. There's a few more exciting gunfights before Renko can get into the facility where the cooker is stored. Here, Renko must wear a mask to avoid the E99 radiation. An oxygen meter will keep Renko moving forward at a brisk pace, and there's an interesting zone here where you will need to jump back and forth between time to solve the puzzle. Demichev's soldiers catch wind of where Renko is and begin an all-out assault on him. Renko has to make his way past heavily armored soldiers and all variety of mutants before he can finally reach the cooker. Now at his destination, Renko travels back into the past to retrieve the activation codes for it. With the code, Renko takes the opportunity to charge the bomb with a functioning cooker. Now with the bomb charged, Renko jumps back to the present and is greeted by a message. At this point, it should be pretty obvious who is writing these messages, but we'll cover that shortly. Back with Beresov, we make our move to plant the bomb. Time is very unstable here at the base of the Singularity, with 1955 bleeding back over into the present frequently. Here, Beresov tells us why Demichev is so interested in the TMD. Demichev believes the TMD you carry can be used to contain it, but he's wrong. How could Demichev possibly think something like that could be controlled? We must get there before Demichev can stop us. A new kind of mutant attacks Renko in a mini boss fight of sorts, but the mutant is no match for the power of the deadlock. Renko must split off from Beresov to supercharge the TMD, allowing him to create a time rift on demand. This rift will allow Renko to travel back to 1955, right at the base of the TMD, and blow it all to hell. On the way to charge the TMD, you experience a few moments from Beresov's past when him and Demichev were on better terms. It works! The time manipulation device works! We did it! <laughs> Congratulations, Dr. Beresov! Incredible! I never would have thought it possible! Thank you, Dr. Demichev. 
Hopefully the TMD can be used to help the world. Now with the TMD having its full potential unlocked, nothing stands in Renko's path. Renko annihilates all enemies in his path and returns to Barasov and opens a rift back into the past. Renko doesn't spend long here and he plants the bomb immediately. Upon detonating, Renko is sent back to the future, but mysteriously, things don't really seem different at all, and the unstable singularity still stands before Renko. Turning around, Renko sees Demichev holding Barasov at gunpoint, laughing at the futility of their plan. All that effort to destroy the singularity when all I had to do was simply rebuild it. Now, give me the TMD. Don't, Renko. We'll Renko stops Demichev, and Barasov has an epiphany. It's not the singularity that's the problem, it's the fact that Renko saved Demichev from dying at the start of the game. Barasov hopes that if Renko can stop himself from saving Demichev, the timeline can be fixed. Amused by this line of thinking, Demichev assures the two that Renko has already tried this before and it's failed. It's here where we get the big reveal that all the messages across the island were written by Renko himself. Additionally, the accident at the singularity causing it to blow up in the past was actually Renko bombing it, as he just did now. Don't you remember who else was there, Captain Renko? <laughs> That other man was you. He's right, Captain. You are the anomaly. Which means the only way to correct the timeline is for you to stop yourself. You mean kill himself. Barasov comes to the conclusion Renko must stop himself by killing himself in the past. Demichev tries to convince Renko that he can join him and help him rule the world. This is a very desperate plea, as at no other point during the game has Demichev thought of asking Renko to join him. I appreciate the option to join Demichev, but having other coercion attempts during the course of the campaign would have made this option more interesting. At this point, Renko is presented with three options, each leading to a different ending. The first option is killing Demichev here, then traveling to the past and stopping yourself. The next is killing Barasov and joining up with Demichev. Finally, the last option is a wild card. Kill both of these men. After beating the campaign with any of these options, you can reload your save and it'll drop you right here so you can experience all the endings. The first ending I went with was killing both Barasov and Demichev. I didn't buy Demichev's proposition of cooperation, and Barasov had got me caught up in enough trouble at this point. Rankos from different timelines had also left enough messages about not trusting Barasov that I was ready to cut ties. Each of these endings has a little video explaining the aftermath of your choice. With Dr. Barasov and Chancellor Demichev dead, the knowledge of E-99 and Katorka-12 dies with them. You disappear and become a legend in the years to come. Most believe you never existed in the first place. The whereabouts of the TMD are unknown. Weeks pass before the bodies of Demichev and Barasov are discovered. The murders are never solved. The death of Chancellor Demichev was the first step in ending Russia's grip on the world. USSR quickly dissolves, defeating factions all vying for power. Wars erupt across the globe as casualties rise into the millions. With their newfound freedom, Mir-12 grows in strength and influence. While they continue their fight against the Russian military, they also begin a manhunt for Dr. Barasov's murderer. To this day, they have been unsuccessful. With the TMD removed from Katorga-12, the singularity destabilizes. A massive explosion destroys the eastern coast of Russia and stretches as far as the prison state of Alaska. A group of Katorga-12 creatures escapes to the Russian mainland and overruns New China. There are rumors of a secret army taking over parts of the former United States. Their leader remains a mystery, but is said to be ruthless, laying waste to all who stand in his way. It is believed his plans involve world domination. His following grows every day. Some claim he is able to summon incredible power, as if he controlled the hand of God himself. This is definitely the chaotic ending, but I like all the destabilization across the world here, and the implication that Renko went back to the US to start his own empire. The good ending was next for me, killing just Demichev and letting Barasov live. Renko then jumps back into 1955 and shoots the previous version of him, who is rescuing Demichev. This would still leave Barasov alive though, which also alters history. The beginning of the game starts playing again, 
but things were different than before with Russian titles and the implication that Beresov used the TMD himself, which enabled the USSR to conquer the world. Finally, the evil ending, where Renko kills Beresov and joins up with Demachev. Demachev is obviously a control freak, and an alliance like this can't last for long. With the TMD, Renko is able to control the Singularity and acts as the leader of Demachev's army. The USSR is an unstoppable force and wipes out all resistance. Tension grows between Demachev and Renko, leading the world back into another Cold War. Chancellor Demachev is the only survivor of Katorga 12. Any mention of Beresov is wiped from history. With the TMD at your disposal, you and Demichev now control the Singularity. Katorga 12 becomes pivotal in Demichev's final push to remove all remnants of rebellion against his leadership. As commander of the military, you forge Demichev's forces into an unstoppable war machine. You even train some of the island's creatures in combat. You use them as a first wave assault in all major battles. Millions are forced into slave labor. With the full power of the Singularity and you at the helm of the military, any pockets of resistance around the world are weeded out. Mir-12 proves difficult at first, but with the TMD by your side, they do not stand a chance. In the years that follow, tensions build within the ruling Russian dictatorship. Your knowledge of advanced weaponry and control of the TMD allows your support to grow. Some believe you are more powerful than Chancellor Demichev himself. Demichev recognizes this and begins a secret weapons development program in the former United States. There are even rumors he's created his own TMD. Conflict seems inevitable as the world once again finds itself in the midst of a cold war between two superpowers. Demichev is already 84 during the modern era in this game, so this guy's aging really well if he can still go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a much younger adversary. After each of the endings, it is revealed that Catherine actually survived at the docks and escaped. While bleeding out, she finds a journal and starts filling it with information. This reveals that Catherine is actually the source of Mir 12's journal, and is the cause of herself meeting up with Renko in the first place. With that, the campaign's over, and this should average players around 7-10 to 10 hours. I had a good time going back through the campaign, and I think if you're looking for a linear shooter, you'll also enjoy it. I'd say this story is serviceable, but there's some fun twists here and there, and there's definitely some nuggets along the way that can help you understand the twists before they happen. Singularity also shipped with a multiplayer component. I never played it back in the day, and I didn't dive into it for this video. Multiplayer features two modes, both of which are asymmetrical. The multiplayer servers for Singularity are offline now, but on the PC, there's a small community on Discord, where people still get together and run games here and there. This involves some modding of the game files, but it's nice to know that this game is still playable online all these years later. Just a heads up, the Discord server has undergone some changes lately and it doesn't seem quite as active for multiplayer sessions anymore, but hopefully it'll pick back up. In multiplayer, one group takes control of human soldiers and the other group controls the creature faction. Each of these factions has several playable classes. Creature players can pick from a number of creatures from the game's single player and a few new ones, while the soldiers are all equipped with guns and TMDs. The multiplayer is a bit reminiscent of the Left 4 Dead modes in which some players control the survivors and the others control the infected. I'm glad I came back and visited Singularity just about 12 years after beating the game for the first time. 
The game holds up fairly well and is definitely a throwback to a different era. Unreal Engine 3 dominated the PS3 and Xbox 360 lifecycle, and the visuals and singularity make it obvious it uses that engine. The gameplay mechanics are still fun, and I can't think of a ton of other FPS games that have explored time travel to such an extent. Whenever I think about this game now, I'll be thinking about how the game could have turned out if Raven Software had more time to polish up the mechanics and the story beats that got cut. I never saw it mentioned anywhere either, but the story definitely gives me Chernobyl vibes. The USSR was looking to capitalize on any resource they could to give them an edge, and E99 was just like someone across nuclear power for the first time. The catastrophe and fallout from the singularity paints a sci-fi picture of what the Chernobyl incident could have been. As of right now, Microsoft is still in the process of acquiring Activision Blizzard, who still owns Raven Software. If the deal goes through, there's a chance Raven Software could get a break from Call of Duty and maybe make another title of their own. If you made it all the way to the end here, I can't thank you enough. I really hope you enjoyed the video, and this was my first time taking a crack at a deep dive analysis like this. I learned a lot from the process and will be making more videos like this in the future. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up, it really helps it out. If you want more gaming essays, subscribe to the channel, there will be a lot more coming soon.